Thank you, thank you, guys. Normally, uh, normally at no, this no, no, phase, hang, hang, hang. we can do better than that, guys. Come on. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> this room is absolutely packed. I'm, I love seeing this energy. Normally, this is the point where I would be saying, "Hey, welcome!" And uh, this is the beginning of the task block. But there's only one game, and it's still longer than anything we've ever done. So there we go. I'm on the couch here with the Axeman and Geyer. I hope that's how you pronounce your name. Let's go with it. All right. <laughs> Jire? What are you, why don't you pronounce let's, it? Let's go with, let's go with Jire. Jire. We'll you got it. All right. Jire. I am Duango AC. You might have seen me do other stuff with Taskbot. I am Taskbot's keeper, but he does all the fun stuff for me. Uh, we're here in, uh, in, in this area just so they can crop the TV. I'm going to turn this off. Now, the very first thing I have to do before we start this run is I have to clear the console memory. And the reason I have to do this is because the task is expecting everything to be in a very, very specific order. So I'm going to plug in TaskBot, unplug my controller, which I won't be using again. I'm going to plug TaskBot in. And so you guys can see what's going on. I've got a visualization board. This is actually the wrong one. We have NES ones. Uh, packing problems mean that all I have are the Super Nintendo variety, but it's fine. Nothing big going on there. All I'm going to do now, I'm going to turn off this console, swap this cartridge with this copy of Final Fantasy here, and uh, then we'll have we'll, we'll start time. So, be prepared, guys. Here goes. You didn't see that. <laughs> I've never done it backward. Uh, all right. So three, two, one, go. <laughs> And so it begins! <laughs> <laughs> so big thanks to everyone who donated for names. As you can see, we have Dan in our party. Uh, because, as always, Dan. Uh, Spud, Siri, and Ori. <laughs> and you will find out eventually who wins. Who lives. <laughs> One of them will live. And thank least. you very much for everybody that did donate for the names, as well as for playing for Four White Mages, which is going to be a very interesting run. Yes. Yes. So from here on out, I'm mostly going to be letting them take over commentary, but I want to talk really quick about what we just saw there. The name entry we di did through a script that the Axeman wrote that helped us to auto automatically generate a movie file in an emulator that uh, we then dumped to the right format that TaskBot needs, which took three minutes. <laughs> so this run is an hour and... Hour and uh, 17 minutes? Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, an hour and 17 minutes. Uh, the whole process took three minutes. So <laughs> when you fast forward an emulator, it can be... Quite, quite a bit quicker. So that's how we got the names in, and everything synchronizes uh, as long as no one touches this table and static shocks it. So <laughs> <laughs> electrostatic discharge in a dry climate such as the one we find ourselves in today, not so good for consistency. So uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to them for commentary on what exactly is happening to Garland right now. He, he's going to get beat down with our hammers. Um, but you notice that we only got three hammers. And that's because one of our white mages isn't going to get to use it. Um, we're going to run with some of them because, well, and one person dies, unfortunately. Sorry, Ori. But, um... <laughs> so the reason why we have to um, have this unfortunate uh, death is because we need, in order to get enough experience for this level up, we need to have one person die. The experience is split between the, the uh, all of your surviving characters, so having fewer characters alive means more experience for everyone else. It also means with fewer characters, less actions to input each round, That's less right. animations that take place. Like, there's a lot of advantages, and you'll see that a lot of this run is done with very, very small numbers of characters, in fact. Yeah. So we're going to have to run from a lot of battles, and every time we have to tell every surviving character, run, run, run. Well. Pretty soon, now it's only run, run, run. You might guess it's probably going to become run, run. Will it go to just run? <laughs> it might. You'll have, to, you'll have to tune in to find out. <laughs> um, all right, so why did we walk all the way out of the castle? We're trying to save some steps. So um, there's a step counter that determines when you get into the random battles. And around Conaria, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of squares that don't have encounters. So we're trying to get onto those so that we have um, our step counter kind of not as far in this list that gets us our next random encounter. And both Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy have roughly a 50% encounter rate around the starting zone. The way Final Fantasy did it was basically half the squares are going to be marked as safe squares, and we'll talk about safe squares throughout. 
the run a lot, pointing out where they're taking advantage or not taking advantage, interestingly, of safe squares as you travel throughout there. Dragon Warrior did the opposite approach, which just said that for certain zones, the encounter rate is simply one half per each check that it was going to do. And those are both equally interesting approaches from a casual gameplay, but for a Taz, it means you can do very different things when you have a 0% chance of something taking place. That's right. So we're running through these enemies. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of running. And a lot of these encounters don't matter so much early on just because we can easily run from all these fights. Um, there is a flag that determines that uh, means some encounters cannot be run from. We're going to be talking about that later. Um, next up, we've got the pirates fight. So there are nine of them. And there's only three of us. So we're going to have to hit every time in order to make this work. And to make it so that we... Um, uh, get this fight fast, we've got to hit them and take them out before they attack us, avoiding a little animation for their, for their attack. At the same time, you notice Dan. He's looking a little low here. I've got a lot of confidence in Dan. Dan is a survivor. He is. I, I think... <laughs> I think Dan might survive a little while. Maybe one more round? Maybe? Maybe long enough just to get this next hit so that we can get the next this battle done in one more round? Well, one of the things that you've done for this optimization is the turn order. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. One of the things you've done for turn order is that the way that turn order works for Final Fantasy is that there are nine monster slots. It doesn't matter if all nine monsters are there. It still puts the nine monsters in a row in a list. Then your four party members at the end of the list. And it'll have a certain number of times just swaps two items in that list. And it's a little bit unfair because you start at the bottom, it doesn't do enough swaps to do a truly fair shuffle. And so you always have a little bit of a disadvantage for your party going first. And that's obviously, for your Taz, very difficult now to get every single time you want to be going first for almost all of these fights. That's right. So these pirates specifically, there's so many random variables, I actually made an optimization script that just tries all sorts of different possibilities. Um, and it's kind of complicated because as you move the cursor, the RNG is changing, so I have to account for how long it takes to move the cursor every time I'm ch checking one of these possibilities. Um, I let the script run for a while, and it tells me, do this, do this, wait so many times, and uh, then you see a fight like that. Yeah, in battle, every two frames, it's going to advance the RNG by one. So when he's moving the cursor out or pausing, as you'll see kind of throughout some of these fights, we notice that oh, there's a bit of a delay, or a really long delay in some cases. For these things. That's the reason why, and there's 256 values that the random number generator can have for its state. So worst case scenario, you're waiting through almost 512 frames, which is about eight and a half seconds that you might have to set through. But ideally, if you're chaining these fights together, you notice a little slight pause for that second run command right yeah. in there. Ideally, you're making that a very small number, and so you might have extra delays in an earlier fight to reduce the delay that you have in a later fight. Yeah. Um, another thing, when we're running from all these fights, I got another script that kind of figures out how do I run from all these enemies? Um, how do I run in, as efficiently as possible? And uh, so there's a few variables to consider. So, you know, there's preemptive attacks. Do you like getting preemptive attacks when you're doing a speed run? I mean, preemptive attacks are pretty good, but they have a one small downside for you. That's right. It takes about uh, the, this message that flashes up saying preemptive. It takes about 10 or 12 frames. And this is a task, so we don't want we don't want to wait when we don't have to. So we actually avoid preemptive encounters, even though you can run 100% of the time. Well, I can run 100% of the time because I can just manipulate the luck to do it. <laughs> All right. So, Speaking of manipulation, so we're in the first of our areas that is going to have bats, and bats for a speed run are always like a terrible thing because they get in your way. You're trying to get very careful on your step route, of course, because you don't want to take extra steps throughout here, so you're having to wait for them to patiently move out of there or push them very slightly. What are you doing in the TAS for the bat manipulation? So, let me just say, they're also annoying in the TAS, <laughs> but that annoyance is only when on the creation side. So, um, what we're doing to get rid of these bats is we're manipulating their movement. Now, the movement of the bats is actually far more random than the actual battle RNG. <laughs> um, because of how the bats move, uh, every time an enemy, m or every time one of these NPCs moves, uh, they sort of are the real enemies. Um, every time one of them they move, they set an uh, uh, an, an an accumulator sort of uh, setup. Uh, it's very um, very random, very butterfly effect type um, RNG, 
and one of the ways we can manipulate it is maybe pausing a frame just before going up a, into the stairs. Uh, if you look real close, maybe you can see it. Maybe, uh, maybe I didn't have to pause. Maybe I figured out some other effect, which includes touching them to make them go faster. <laughs> so this fight, even for a task, we're pushing it pretty close. We've got two white mages, and these wizards hit pretty hard. Sorry, Spud. Oh, I don't think Spud was so much a meat shield as just a... Oh, never mind. Yeah. Oh. So Spud had to take a hit so that Siri could get, <laughs> so that Siri could get the uh, the ruse spell off. That ruse spell we bought in the first town. Um, what what it does is it increases your evade stat. After casting it twice, these wizards can't really hit us. So now we can basically go to town on them with our hammer here. It's going to take a few hits, and so um, we really need that ruse spell in order to get them missing get those hits in. They have 84 uh, HP each, and we can do 26, 30 or so. I think it's 30 max with our hammer here. So it's going to take three hits. And that's two wizards beaten with two white mages. <laughs> well, more like one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something going on between Taskbot and Siri that we should know about? <laughs> uh, last I knew, you see, there used to be something going on between Taskbot and GDQ Monitor, but GDQ Monitor has sort of gone dormant. Uh, so uh, we've also discovered that Taskbot doesn't seem to have any concerns about monogamy. <laughs> so <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure, maybe. <laughs> It is 2019, after all. <laughs> there are a lot of people who have claimed her. Uh, do we have any donation incentives while we're backtracking? Or no, do, I mean donation comments. Well, we do have this one donation. Hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, from a certain Duango AC <laughs> for $951. <laughs> this donation is on behalf of everybody that donated to NAMI during Desert Tesla Charity Drive. Duango would like to thank everybody who tuned in and donated. So some context around that. I, uh, I, I got really lucky one year with, uh, with selling some Bitcoin and bought a Tesla. Uh, very brief moment of, uh, of, of very nice, nice uh, profitability, but it didn't last very long. But it was long enough to buy a Tesla. So I decided, hey, I've got a Tesla. Let me do something with it. So the Axeman and I drove all the way from California to here while using crowd control from Warp World, uh, which is a tool that allows you to uh, while streaming, let your viewers mess with you and change various characteristics of your game, often while also playing a rando. Uh, so we applied crowd control to the car. So <laughs> while we were driving, people were tuned in, watching the live stream for up to, oh, it took us 16 hours to get here, um, while they were controlling the temperature of the car. <laughs> Um, and as a result, they made $951 of direct donations uh, directly to NAMI uh, through, through the tracker, uh, or a tracker, that we're also listing here as part of this event. And additionally made another contribution that you saw maybe earlier in this week that was for the bits and uh, subscriptions that happened on Twitch as part of that. All told, uh, people donated over $1,500 to NAMI during that drive, and I want to tell everyone who participated in that, thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in at Task.Bot uh, for that, and uh, we'll be doing it, maybe? I, are you up for doing it again? <laughs> I mean, they cranked our temperature to 118. That was very, that was definitely an experience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, uh, but th that's the end of me ranting about that. It, but it was a great opportunity for us to do just a little bit more uh, on our way here for NAMI, and, I'm, uh, and it's a great cause, so I gotta tell you, it's something I was very happy we could do, so. One of these interesting technical achievements that you kind of see around Duango. If you ever get a chance to watch his stream, please do. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there is another one, if you don't mind me getting a couple more in. Go for it. Okay. Okay, this is from our very own The Sid here on site, who donates $60 and says, Hey, everyone. It's time for my yearly donation. I love all of you, and I'm so happy to be here with everybody. As help, uh, And I'm helping as one of the many doing audio and video for these events for everybody to enjoy. Events like this came along in a dark time for me after my elder brother Will passed away, the person I took the screen name The Sid from. This is in memory of him, my once and always big bro Will. 
I love you all, and I hope you're enjoying this event. Well, we love you too, Sid. Thank you. So uh, we we just beat Astos, the dark elf uh, king or something like that, and um, <laughs> Astos gave us quite a lot of experience, but we only got one level up. We got enough experience to get two. If we were to look at our status menu right now, it would say something like minus 65,000 because the counters rolled over. <laughs> um, but we're going to make that right in a little bit here. Uh, we're going to fight an enemy. Any enemy will do anything as long as we win the fight and we will get our level up because we're a white mage and we really need every level we can get. <laughs> so it wasn't a lot of experience, but it's enough for our level up here. Another point about the level ups. So when you get a level up, um, every class has certain stats that they get on certain levels. Um, a white mage conveniently gets intelligence every level up. What does intelligence do, Jire? Does absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the white mage. Um, you know, if you have a fighter, he gets strength every level. It's great. Um, and because strength makes your attack power, every two strength you get a point of attack power. And when you have to fight the bosses um, one hit at a time, that strength is really useful. So the, the white mage only gets strength on a few level ups. However, when you don't get that guaranteed strength, there's still a 25% chance you could get it. And given this is a task, is it really 25%? So we're gonna, gonna manipulate, no. yes. <laughs> we're gonna manipulate that strength. So we get a little more strength. It's gonna make some later bosses, um, Actually, pretty soon, it's going to come up, well, actually, it's not going to come up for a while. We're, we're, our hammer is actually going to be sheathed for quite a while here, conveniently. Um, we'll get to that. But later on, that strength that we're building up is going to come into play and make a few fights a, a little shorter. And right now, we're just in a fetch quest sequence, so maybe, Duango, this would be a great time for you to talk a little bit about Taz videos and what a Taz is. All right, so what you're watching is, I'm going to start with what a tool-assisted speedrun is. And uh, to do that, I'm going to go way back hundreds of years. <laughs> you think I'm joking, but I'm not. Uh, it turns out that there is some prior art that's very similar to a tool-assisted speedrun, and it's a player piano. Back in the day, people used to build very elaborate machines that automatically played music, and by the 1920s, it was really common to have what was called a player piano. It was just a piano that you could accept a piano scroll, usually paper with punched holes in it, that would play through and play a sequence of notes that as the scroll continued to unravel and unroll, it would play through the entire sequence of a song. Well, a tool-assisted speedrun is very similar to a player piano. Instead of playing a predefined sequence of notes to play, to compose, or play a composition of music, it's playing back a predefined sequence of button presses to play back a pre-recorded run of a game. Now, what the Axeman spent, how long did you work on this? <laughs> uh, this particular run, uh, a few months, year and off. Yeah, off yeah. That's kind of what I thought. In, what's funny about making a tool-assisted speedrun, it looks fast, <laughs> but it's not. Um, it's not artificial intelligence. This is very much the product of a human being sitting down in front of an emulator of a original console, usually, that perfectly, as much as possibly perfectly, emulates all, all of the hardware inside of that real console. The video pro uh, processing unit, the, uh, the PPU, the audio processing unit, all of the characteristics of the hardware as accurately as possible. And in addition, there's some extra fun things because the, each cartridge often had different mappers, extra chips that were included in the cartridge that also have to be properly emulated. And with an accurate enough emulator, it's possible to take something that was recorded, a sequence of button presses that was recorded in an emulator, and play them back on a console. Now, what I do with TaskBot is not what the majority of people do on task videos. Most people on task videos never touch a physical console other than, generally, legally owning the cartridge that they're, they're, uh, they're playing the game of. Just throwing that out there. Uh, but <laughs> uh, if Nintendo's watching, I have two, uh, an, an exact copy of Final Fantasy sitting next to the EverDrive one that you saw that I was, I was using earlier just to, to demonstrate that I'm doing everything legally. Just throwing it out there, as the ambassador of Task Videos, I want to be above reproach. Um, <laughs> so, long and the short of it, when you're working with an emulator, you've taken a, a, an image, a snapshot, a, a copy of the cartridge 
and you've placed that inside of an emulator, and when it's in that environment, you have full control of the entire system. You can see memory values, you can see every last register of the, of the processor, you can see every value you might care about. You can have tools that allow you to search through memory to find certain things. For instance, just night before last, you looked specifically to see if a particular enemy could be uh, run, if you could run away from a particular enemy. Uh, well, because we can disassemble effectively the game, we can figure out certain things about how the game behaves. In addition to that, if you're using a tool-assisted uh, speedrun-capable emulator, you can record your movie, your, what's called a, a task movie. You record your button presses in order. You can create save states before you try something risky. Say you're playing a platformer. I know we're at an RPG limit break, but just for the moment. Say you run into an enemy and you die. You can always restore your state to a previous point, try jumping over them again, and if you don't die and you like your progress, you can save that state and keep going. You can always back up to an earlier point at any time, so there's no risks in trying anything new or exotic. You can try every strategy that would possibly be so far buried in the game that it would be dif difficult to, uh, to execute. So one of the beautiful things about being able to use an emulator to, to play through a game is you can completely eliminate human, well, challenges like skill, reflexes, luck, especially this game. <laughs> um, you don't have to worry about any of those things because if anything goes wrong, you can always back up and try a different sequence of events. That doesn't mean that it's, is, that it's easy, it just means that it's possible. You have the tools that allow you to do amazing things, but with those tools come a lot of time investment. And oftentimes, one of the characteristics that we use to define how much effort went into a tool-assisted speedrun is how many times you had to back up and try another segment again. We call those re-records. And uh, what was the re-record account on this particular run? Um, 10,000 or so. Yeah, 10,000 re-records yeah. is pretty, yeah. pretty common. <laughs> I, I topped 100,000 on Crystal as easy. You also worked on that run for how many years? Oh, yeah, at least two or three, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that process of making a tool-assisted speedrun of a game, it, it's not fast. What you see here is what I call a work of art. And I, I really consider tool-assisted speedruns to be a work of art. It's something that has been chiseled at over time, perfected. In many cases, this is the result of previous runs that were completed and then obsoleted because someone else found, or the same person found, improvements. And we get to the point where sometimes a single frame is enough to obsolete a previous movie because that's all the more that we can be improved. Um, the last bit in the chain here, what I did at the very beginning, closing full circle here, I took the, con uh, the, the movie file that was made inside of the emulator we used, which was FCEUX. We dumped that, is what we call it, into the format that Taskbot needs. Now this particular replay device is the Task TM32 board made by Onosaurus with a case crafted by, well, crafted cart by some chance. Uh, so it's got a 3D case for once. So Taskbot's looking very dapper today. Um, sort of, his, uh, his backbone is starting to become a little weak though. So he's, he's kind of lower than he used to be in his, his younger years. So we might have to rebuild Taskbot. But <laughs> uh, so we are now playing back that movie file that I generated at the beginning of our run. It's just a file format that specifies the exact sequence of button presses to send uh, that, that Taskbot's now sending to the real console. Because the emulation in FCUX is so accurate, we're able to get exactly the same results on real hardware. The only concerns we have at this point is someone creating static electricity, touching the table, <laughs> causing it to miss a, a button press, and uh, yeah. And with an hour and 17 minute yeah. run, that's, that's the problem. I've now talked much longer than I probably should have, so I'm gonna hand it back over to them for commentary. Well, I do wanna put out one thing, this is a run that has no resets, it does not power the game off, and that is something that is different categories of Final Fantasy, depending on which one you want to play. And for a Taz in particular, whenever you're writing to battery back memory, that's something that's still not quite perfect for the emulation, so like, this is a much easier thing to get synced up than anything that touches the save game, and we still have trouble with reset and power as we've seen in some of the ones that you've done in the past, Duango. That's right. The, um, so if you watch the video on Taz videos, You've got, um, there are resets, both soft and hard, in order to uh, squeak out more time. The reason why you do that is because if you do a hard reset, you reset the uh, RAM of the console, um, and then you can, that resets things like uh, what pattern the enemy show up in, 
and that gets us fewer enemies. It gets us uh, enemies that we can run from, which is going to come up pretty soon. And um, we can do a lot of things that we couldn't do before. The RAM reset was important because, um, as I mentioned earlier, the NPC movement is much more random than the actual battle movement. So random, in fact, that it uses uninitialized RAM in its uh, to seed that initial uh, movement. And so we need to get that RAM to a known state so that the task will sync. Uh, everything in the task has to, every, like the starting state has to be uh, known in order for a uh, task to sync. And it just so happens, for top loaders, I found very consistent memory. Um, so that's what we generally use for Final Fantasy speedrunning. Recommend that you have a top loader if you ever want to try Final Fantasy 1 speedrunning at home. Front loaders, about half of them have the right state. Some of them, though, take a really long time to clear. So you yeah. have to turn the console off and sit there for a couple of minutes waiting for the memory to go back to its base state. Some just have crazy base states. And yeah. that's just kind of an unfortunate thing when you use uninitialized memory. If you think about how these consoles were made over many years, many different assembly lines, different countries, they source different parts throughout here. Um, so there is really no canonical definition of how Nintendo works, but we have enough examples of similar behavior, which we can say we can use that one as our base reference. Right, and there's a lot to unpack there. If you actually break down what's happening here, we're talking about RAM, which is considered volatile storage as opposed to your hard drive or solid state drive that's considered non-volatile. And it's called volatile because if you don't have power going to it, it isn't constantly refreshing the electric... Oh, there's, there's all kinds of stuff I won't get into, <laughs> but it's not constantly keeping power to the RAM uh, to keep the state of memory. Uh, it's volatile in the sense that if you don't have power, the state is no longer guaranteed. And basically, the funny thing about the front loaders, the earlier consoles, they tend to have memory that is not as volatile, oddly, which is kind of, we would think that would be a good thing, but in our case, we really want it to forget everything right away. And for whatever reason, the top loaders are better about forgetting everything. Who thought? Can I make yeah. a, a quick announcement? Sure. Uh, we have had an absolutely huge flurry of donations, which I thank you all for. And it has allowed us to reach our latest milestone of $70,000. All right, let's jump back into the gameplay here because we've skipped over exploiting some of the things from movement tech in particular here. You've got, in this area, a really big concern with these guys' shadows because of their 90% plus ambush rate. Yeah. But we also have a lot of movement tech in terms of where we want to navigate around the map, particularly with the boat. Um, and we'll see that a little bit as we come in and out of here. Tell us kind of like what your search process was like for figuring out like what is your right way of routing through this yeah. Earth Cave section. Okay, so in Earth Cave, um, what you didn't see was that on that third floor that we had to walk all the way around and beat the vampire and then walk all the way back, there's a fairly common encounter with the wizards, the boss that we fought earlier in Marsh Cave. We're a few levels higher, but we're not that much stronger, and so we really don't want to have to fight them again because we can't run. Um, so I just made sure that we didn't run into any of them. Um, and we do that by um, doing things like moving extra places other where... Um, uh, moving extra spaces in uh, the outer world or in dungeons. Um, but it's easier to move in the boat because the boat moves twice as fast. So if we can tweak things on the boat, it's even better. And you might have noticed that when we go into a dock, sometimes we go on the first square of the dock and we walk around a little. It's a little slower because um, we have to walk around, but the squares on the dock are safe squares. They don't uh, increase the encounter that move, uh, gets our random battles. So by doing that, we can avoid some random battles um, and put the encounters in the right place so that we don't get these wizards in, Mar in Earth Cave here and other places where there will be um, unrunnable encounters. And the unrunnable encounters are kind of funny sometimes. There's obviously the bosses, which are unrunnable. That would be kind of bad if you could run away from those guys. Yeah. Then there is a bunch of random encounters that just, you don't make any sense. Um, and the reason that it happens is because they did a funny thing for storing the encounter tables. So there's like an A side and a B side of all the encounters. And what you see for a lot of these random, why is this guy unrunnable thing, is because it's actually the B side of a boss fight. Um, so that's double duty that's causing a lot of this effect. It happens to be interesting for this run in particular because you have to dodge around almost all of those unrunnables. There's a couple times later on 
think it gets the zombies. That's right. There's just like no easy way around it. But figuring out ways that you kind of thread the needle through this encounter table is much, much harder than you would at first imagine, simply because Final Fantasy 1 has a ton of unrunnables there. So am I going the right way here? What this happened? This looks a little bit like you're going in the wrong direction. So what happened here is I'm trying to avoid these wizards, and if I just go straight through, um, I, I need to take some extra steps. Um, maybe get a couple extra encounters, and that's going to help us avoid getting wizard fights. And I decided i got to take extra steps anyway. Let's take a little scenic route. Yeah, Castle Speedrun, we just usually walk back and forth on one tile just so we can count it out more easily. But when you're able to do things like a Taz, you can figure out more interesting patterns for entertainment. That's something that kind of comes up as a Taz video topic of, you know, you're not just being the first to finish, fast as possible frames, but you also want to make a task that's interesting for people to watch. Yeah, especially if you have an opportunity where you don't have any difference in time. In other words, a lot of times we'll even say in the submission notes on testvideos.org for a new submission, entertains without wasting time. Or uh, basically, anytime you have an auto-scroller where there's nothing that is going to change the amount of time something takes, if you can do entertaining things, why not? In Gradius, a delicate spelled his name out. <laughs> Auto strollers can be a lot of fun, but um, here there's there's only a few things we can really do, um, but we're gonna see some some interesting stuff. And if you you know if you kind of loosen it up a little and decide, hey, I'll I'll give up a little bit of time to get a little a lot more entertainment. There's a lot you can do. I think we're gonna see some of it later, hopefully. I hope so. So coming up, we have one thing that happens in the real time speed runs as well which is there are wizards on the third floor and the fourth floor of this dungeon. That's right. And they happen to not align for where they are. There's, in the encounter table, eight different groups that are used to mark out the enemy spawn formations. In this case, wizards on the third floor are in a different group than the wizards on the fourth floor. So we're actually going to take advantage of that by going down to the fourth floor here. This is burning off one encounter that you would otherwise get upstairs. Go back up to the third floor after taking a certain number of steps here and then burn an encounter that would be wizards on the fourth floor. And so this way you have the ability to skip that particular encounter across both of these, even though it's what looks to be the same formation as a casual player. You're not gonna be able to recognize the fact that internally the game has done these coded differently between each floor of the dungeon. Yeah, this just looks absurd if you don't know why it's going on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I thought this was the fastest possible. <laughs> why are you walking in circles? <laughs> You also have to come out a little bit because all those tiles around that staircase down, everything inside that little square, those are all safe squares. So that little bottleneck, that one square was the closest tile to the stairs that actually has an encounter on it. Can Which I is optimization right there. Yeah. Can I right. rapid fire out a few donations if you don't mind? Sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, I have $101.11 from Care Bear 21 The reason I wanted to read this is it's the donation that took us over the 70000 So. Hi RPG Limit Break, I'm making my annual donation to this fantastic cause. Shoutouts to Gyra, my favorite fantasy Final Fantasy streamer. May this donation light the four orbs and push <laughs> the donation total over 70k. Well, thank you very much for that. We're thank coming you. up on our first of the four fiends, Lich, here. So it happens to be that during this stretch you have all undead monsters in a row, which is great for the White Mage. You have an anti-undead spell, the pretty much only offense the White Mage has until the very end of the game where you get the uh, little fade spell, which is what they called holy back in the day when you couldn't say certain references in Nintendo games. But that is so far away that you need class change and other things. Of course we're gonna get class change eventually, right? No, no, we're gonna skip that. There's a lot of things we're gonna skip. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the white mage, um, if you might have noticed in Elfland, we bought this harm two spell. We've also got the harm spell that we got in uh, First Town in Conaria. Um, so we're gonna take an Ice 2 spell, take a little damage here. Now, how, how tough is that Ice 2 spell? So it's anywhere between 40 and 160. I noticed you got 40, which means you not only resisted the magic defense check, super hard to do, uh, but it also rolled the minimum possible on that 40 to 80 range you What a have. coincidence. I don't know how you do it there. <laughs> um, and all the spells for the monsters, as well as their skills, are scripted. So when a monster uses spells or skills, it is a list that they have. It just goes in order that list. So you can actually, well, for a real-time run as well, know exactly the order that they're going to use their spell moves or their skill moves, but there's a certain percentage chance that they're going to attack, use a spell, or use a skill every round. So that's also part of the manipulation that you'll see throughout here, is controlling which of those three types of attacks the monster is going to choose. So one of the other spells that we picked up is called Mute, and it, um, it disables enemies' magic. 
and when an enemy has magic disabled, they'll still try and cast the magic, but it'll be ineffective. It just won't do anything. They'll lose their turn. Um, and we haven't been using that. The reason is because we just... It takes another turn to cast Mute, and if we can get around it, you know, let's, let's do it. But yeah, we'll, so we'll see later on if that becomes necessary. Yeah, I was going to talk about that because for the four white mages not tool assistant, which is possible to do four white mages in a single sitting as a human player. A single sitting? How long is that sitting? It was about ten hours, so it took some time. But <laughs> you actually tend to use Mute quite a lot. And so, for example, the Astos fight. Using Mute on him and then a whole bunch of ruses, you could actually beat Astos down with hammers as long as your fingers don't wear off. It takes like eight minutes of hammering. But you can lock the bosses down, and that's true except for critical hits, which bypass the evasion check. Of course, you're not going to get critical hits on your party here. But it, a lot of these techniques you see are actually not as crazy as you would think. Um, you know, there might be additional setup required to make them safe. You might need some more levels, you, because you're not going to get criticals, you're going to get regular attacks in there. But some of this you can actually apply to real runs as well, which is kind of the cool part of RPG speedruns is you tend, for Final Fantasy at least, not to have any crazy things where you're doing like left plus right on controllers or things that are not even possible for the input on it. So is there anything that you found from the TAS that helped your world record run? Um, from the TAS, a lot of the things that were really helpful were actually the tools that were built as a result. Interesting. So finding out, like, here's the table of encounter groups, here's the step counter table. Those were things that were developed as part of the TAS work that has been very beneficial for doing routing for real-time runs as well. So having those resources is something that gets shared across different communities. And so it's really great whenever a TAS kind of leaves a whole bunch of notes and documentation around because you can often use that in unexpected ways. Yeah, and this is actually a really good time to point out that there used to be a little bit of animosity between certain communities because of misunderstandings, especially with the original 2003 run of Super Mario Bros. 3 made by Morimoto that was not properly labeled at least not in English, that was one of the very early tool-assisted speedruns that people saw all the way back prior to YouTube even existing, really, really bad WMV video, and it wasn't properly labeled as a tool-assisted speedrun. The result was that there was a lot of, of anger when it came out that, oh no, this is clearly not, not human viable. What, this playthrough was, was a total f fraud. It was, it was cheating, right? And a tool-assisted speedrun should not in any way, shape, or form be used to compare the performance of a human runner. They're not the same ar artwork. They're a totally different class of, of work of art. But as tool-assisted content has been labeled properly, especially with Bizquit, who founded NES Videos, which became taskvideos.org, started to make sure that there were always really good markers on every single tool-assisted video to say, hey, this is where you can find more information about what this is. This was made with tools. With that disclaimer in place and with further communication between the two communities, we're now at a point where oftentimes the TAS will use a route found initially by human testing and the, the human runners will use techniques, uh, sometimes found that were in theory TAS only, that through maybe input buffering or some other technique are viable in real-time runs or are simply information that you couldn't find any other way other than using an emulator and working through what you would need to do to make a tool-assisted speedrun, very much like what the Axeman did. So this is actually very, very common nowadays where tool-assisted speedrun content influences real-time runs and vice versa. And I love seeing that synergy between the two communities, not only because I'm the ambassador for test videos, but seriously, there's some awesome stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. All right, we're about to go through Ice Cave, one of the more dangerous parts of speedruns here, just because almost everything in here can kill you quite easily. Um, there are two unrunnable encounters you're having to dodge around. One is wizards, which appear in even larger quantities. So if we had a hard time beating two wizards, it's three to seven in here, you'd have at least 50% more wizards at minimum for encounters. And there's also frost giant frost wolf throughout the rest of the dungeon. So obviously you're having to do a lot of encounter manipulation here to get the right groups as you're walking through. That's right. Um, you might have seen me do a few extra um, sailing, taking a little extra... Uh, Taking a little joyride on my ship before actually getting in here. Um, that, that, that helps avoid some encounters. Um, we're also doing things like not stepping on safe squares sometimes. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, not stepping on the safe squares is sort of a trade-off. Um, like in the case of the ship, we can go further into the dock. Now we've got a... Um, uh, we save some time from having to walk around. Maybe we can make up the... Uh, the 
spaces, those safe squares that we uh, that we need. We can make that up somewhere else. Um, I'm doing all sorts of calculations. I actually set up a script that that I enter how many steps I take in each area, and it spits out where all here's all the encounters you get, and a, puts a big red flag when it says, "Oh, you can't run from this one." Um, and I just I have it optimize, uh, try different techniques, uh, take different uh, numbers of steps other places, and that's how we avoid these fights. And some examples in that previous room, if you walked along the bottom edge at that doorway, those would be safe squares down there. You walk straight up instead. That's right. Here you're going to walk on some damage tiles. You could walk on one more damage tile there. All the damage tiles are safe squares, but you're actually intentionally taking more steps than you need to here so that you can pull a later encounter forward. That's right. Um, that later encounter is um, going to be, it would have been a white, uh, or uh, it would have been a wizard battle on the uh, first floor, but instead it's going to be something else on this floor that we can run from. That's going to be later on, but uh, a lot of these cases, it, it sort of, it goes, uh, I'm kind of optimizing globally. It's another thing you do in a task. Um, you can look a little uh, further ahead, rather than just your your current dungeon or something, and you have these global optimizations. Sometimes makes it, for example, picking up some gold or a heal potion. You know I'm going to use it sometime. It may not be for a little while. <laughs> you pretty much don't pick up anything you're not going to actually use. <laughs> That's right. Uh, do we have an opportunity at any point in the... Uh, I know he still has donations pending, so... I think this would be a great time to get some donations in, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go! <laughs> Buckle in. We've got $10 from Tiny Tim who says, Hey all, I'm loving the Final Fantasy Task Bot run as it's the only Final Fantasy game I've actually completed. <laughs> Thanks on the run. I've got $50 from JDW who says donating on behalf of the Oak Group from Twitch Chat who was unable to donate because they couldn't afford it. Thank you for that. I've got $100 from our own Ashen Prime sitting on the sound desk who says, It may be obvious, but that doesn't mean it's not appropriate. This goes to naming Robo Taskbot in Rock Chrono Trigger. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. $112 from Bing Chang who's making up because he says this is for all the resets during the quest run last night. Thank you for having us, and good luck to the rest of the runners. And I'd like to finish out this little block with a $225 donation from Cy Wildfire, who says, I lost my father 15 years ago to mental illness. Having something like this existing is so important, and I'm glad to donate to the cause. I love the Final Fantasy series, and I cannot wait to see Taskbot break this game over its knees. <laughs> <laughs> wait, hang on. Does Taskbot have knees? Um, not exactly. <laughs> but again, thank you for that $225 donation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> canonically, um, canonically, Taskbot has a Roomba he rides on, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to the speed run. So we just picked up a whole bunch of gold. That's going to be used to buy the bottle later on. That costs a lot of money, and so we're having to pull the money here. It would be either like here or Cardia, probably the two choices that you would have to be able to grab the, enough money for the bottle in a timely fashion. And Obviously, why do we need a bottle? Well, there is a uh, quest into the Sea Shrine, which is going to be probably one of the top three fights, I would say, for what you have to do for a tool-assisted speed run for doing Final Fantasy One here going to be very much looking forward to that one coming up. There's one thing I should mention. The word reset's been thrown around, or specifically no reset. This particular replay device and this particular console have, uh, have the ability to be soft reset, where we can hold the reset line to ground, and just by, by, by touching that signal and holding it to ground, we can trigger the reset on, on the console without clearing memory. Because remember, power is still actively being sent to memory, so memory's state is preserved but you have told the game, the CPU, to start over. So we could do that part of it, but it gets a lot harder when you need to completely kill power and make sure the memory is cleared. So we thought about different ways of trying to do a resets run and just decided it was way too unsafe for any kind of marathon situation. So this particular run was adapted. It's, it's uh, how much longer, what's the, what's the time difference between this oh, and five reset? minutes. Yeah. So this, this is a little bit longer because we're not doing the reset, and it also it caused you a substantial amount of rerouting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I had to reroute a little bit to make this work with no resets. Uh, one of the things you're going to see in just a little bit 
is um, we're going to take a little joyride here. We, we should have stopped right there. Wait, where are we going? Um, so we're going to need to use the floater at Ryukan Desert to get the airship. We're taking a, a little extra route here with the ship because we need to burn off some uh, on the step counter. And that's going to avoid some uh, fights later that we can't run from. And those tile types are also important because the encounter rate is based on where you are in the world. So the boat has the lowest encounter rate. You can actually use that to skip past encounters that would otherwise take place on land. Dungeons actually, interestingly, have a slightly lower encounter rate than the overworld does, which is unusual for a lot of RPGs. And then there are some special dungeon floors that have higher rates. We're going to see one of those at Sky Castle, the highest encounter rate of the game, in fact, is the floor where Warmack normally is. And then we have a couple of random floors, so like, as you go down Temple of Fiends, you visit it, each of the elemental floors is slightly higher in encounter rate than the previous one. But for the most part, throughout the game, you have boat as the place where you're going to have the least encounters, dungeons in between, but pretty close to where the overworld is, and then overworld the highest encounter rate. That's right. And part of the manipulation is just to get fewer regular encounters. Even if we can run, it's better not to have so many of these encounters that we, that we have to run from, because it takes some time. So here in this town, um, where we used the bottle there, so backing up to where we used the floater and got the airship, I don't know if everyone saw that. Hopefully, uh, if your eyes were quick enough, you might have noticed that we used that heal potion. So now we have um, a little more HP. And uh, we're kind of combining those menu trips where we can. Yeah, go going into and out of the menus is pretty slow in Final Fantasy because it takes time to redraw. That's something that you use in real-time speedruns as well, is trying to optimize your menu movement. I notice that you have like specific places that you want to put items in your menus, specific spell placement that you want to have, just to minimize the total amount of cursor actions, both in battle as well as outside. So, number of cursor actions isn't so much a problem in a task, because we can move the cursor so fast. And, um, and how can you do that faster than a real-time run? Um, because the, the um, task bot can press the button in, um, at uh, 60 hertz. Well, I guess it'd be 30 hertz it's for every yeah, press. 30, press. 30 hertz with one button, and you can alternate, alternate different buttons That's at 60 right. hertz. That's another one. So you can press up one frame, right another frame, up another frame, A, um, whatever you need to do to get the menu. Uh, if you saw us enter the names, that was how we did it. Yeah, and this is why sometimes in certain games that can respond to every single frame, you'll oftentimes see a staircase, because if you wanted to go down four times and something like that, you'd, you wouldn't want to press down, let go, down, let go, down, down. That would take longer. It, if you said down, right, down, right, down, if you, you walked it over, it ends up being a little faster. Because you get a new action every single turn that way. You don't have to wait for the button release. All right, so we're walking through the sea shrine. My favorite shrine of the game. It's got the best music. It's where you, in the Final Fantasy, normally are going to have your abilities kind of branch out very well for the first time. You get items that you can use in combat. We're going to pick one of those up here very soon, the Mage Staff which allows us to cast Fire 2 in battle. Finally, we're going to have something for our White Mage to actually be able to attack with. And we have a really big feed fight coming up, so maybe Bob, <laughs> squeeze in some donations before we get to Mr. Kraken at the Can bottom here. Can do. So, we have $100 from Sid Citrus, who says, I've seen Final Fantasy 1 getting run by a great task bot. Thanks for the entertainment and all the work you do. I have another hundred dollars from Squatcher Meal who says, even Taskbot can't keep Dan alive. Let's cast XXXX on <laughs> mental illness. Twenty-five dollars from Henny022, who says, I'm glad to see my Dwango and best gamer Bob on the stage. Sorry, Rob on the stage. I thought you were talking about me for a moment. Uh, wishing for good RNG <laughs> does nothing here. Let's, so let's hope for no desyncs instead. Aw, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Henny. I have an amazing Discord community that's, that's grown over the years of us doing TaskBot uh, task stuff at GDQ and other events. And uh, I got to tell you, thank you so much for everyone who's part of my Discord and my community, uh, YouTube, Twitch. Thank you very much for all the support. Got uh, $50 from IzzyZig, who says, Final Fantasy is the first game I ever found my, losing myself in. And I suppose I never really completely found my way out again. The love and effort put into this task shows, and although I don't actually need to do this, I want to wish the best of luck to Taskbot <laughs> as it brings light back to the. Wait, what are those called again? <laughs> Five dollars from Garland, who says, <laughs> "Garland here. If you think your work of art has a chance to beat me, 
you are wrong. I just learned how to time travel. And there's a little bit here that I'm going to do in the style of a game later that we have in the marathon. So, <clears throat> ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> Guy W sends $75 and says, Finally caught you live. Great run, great work. Oh, thanks, Guy. He's a great friend. And Hotbot from here on site sends $25 and says, Thank you, Taskbot, for always representing the bot community well. <laughs> Beep boop. <laughs> $15 from Z Zindraris who says, Love some robots playing video games. <laughs> Twenty, uh, sorry, fifty dollars from Terra eighty three. He says, putting this money to name all of the Aeons Veil for because that won't confuse them at all. <laughs> <laughs> Railmon donates fifty and says, I had to donate during Taskbot. Thank you. And just a, a small heads up. Uh, we did just open up a lot of uh, bid wars for Earth, Earthlock later on this uh, today. So if you want to look at the Earthlock incentives, go ahead and take a look at those now. All right, thank you very much there, Bob. We're coming up on crack, and we got a couple more floors. This is an interestingly crinkly dungeon as well, because you go up and down quite a lot throughout here. I noticed that this is a particular place where you've got a lot more preemptives than I see elsewhere. Was this a tough dungeon for you to route because of the number of monsters, or what was going on there? Yeah, so the running from enemies, getting preemptives, um, a lot of it's, uh, so the main thing is running is fast. However, when we get to a boss, um, there's kind of a spot in the RNG. And remember we said there's a cycle of, of um, 256 numbers. Sometimes there's one particular spot on there we want to be. And if we were just past that spot, we would have to wait those eight and a half seconds to get to it again. That would be a shame. So um, we'll do things like get a preemptive, take the, that, uh, what, 10 frame loss, and, um, and then we'll, we'll save eight seconds by being at just the right spot in the RNG at the right time. And you'll see that um, being in the right spot at the right time um, at Kraken is going to make a big deal. Yeah, this is going to be our last boss where we don't have the Bane Sword, so once we have a way to instantly kill bosses, it's going to be a little bit different for the setup, but you just have a White Mage and a Silver Hammer. That's this right. is going to take a really long time, isn't it, to beat this guy? That's right. Are we going to count it down? How many is it going to take? <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at how much damage we do in each hit. And because um, I can tell you, the RNG cycle takes just about as long. The entire RNG um, cycle lasts about as long for each round. Um, and then, uh, so we'll be getting the same damage each turn. So if we look at how much damage we get the first turn, we can figure out how many turns it's going to be. All right, so Kraken's got 800 hit points. That's right. Let's find out what our White Mage does. And as you kind of look at the manipulation for this, there is, out of those 256 values, three of those 256 are going to get critical hits. You notice that we're going to need a critical hit every single time here. So just going to space these out. And uh, meanwhile, so you've got Kraken pretty much just sitting here doing ink over and over again. This is normally a really ferocious boss. <laughs> so 800 HP divided by 32 damage each turn is... Dwango's calculating. Many. It's 25. That's right. So how many are you up to now? Four. <laughs> so that 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. I can do math. Whoa. 20? I hope I got my math right. So down to 20. 20. So okay. we got that, that. That logically means that we have 19 more. Now 18 oh. more. I think what you're saying is, Bob, we have some time for some intimidations. <laughs> yeah, this is going to take a I while. I just got a couple of doozies. The first one is from a uh, regular attendant, but not here this year, Dan, God of Thunder. Oh, hey, Dan. Who donates $25 and says, I really hate this running gag. For just once, I'd like not to die. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> then we have uh, an anonymous $10 donation. It says, thanks so much to the commentary team on how TAS runs actually work and some of the history behind them. It's been such a great watch. Love what you do and the cause that you support. And then, from Voolagin, <laughs> I have a $2,000 donation. Wow. Wow.
who says, I figured it was about time to donate to this lovely event I help run. What better time than during the first RPG I ever played? I'll have plenty of thanks to share at the end of the event, but for now, let me say thank you to my great friends and family who supported me through some challenging times early this year, particularly Ico, without whom we may not literally have a functioning event. Thank you for everything, and let's get a new donation PB. Oh, wow. I think on behalf of everyone in this room, thank you. Yeah, one more round for this village of that, yeah. yeah thank you. I love you, man. All right, back to Kraken. You've been keeping count, Dwango? No, I, I lost count. I, I, I mean, I was doing good, and then I heard that number and the person who did it, and I just totally lost it. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, man. I, I really mean that. That's even more than the 800 HP that Kraken has. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all just about there. So there's a 25% chance that he uses ink. So it's actually not too... Uh, getting uh, getting him to use the ink isn't actually that hard. Getting him to use ink uh, 25 times in a row, uh, you could probably uh, figure out the probability there. The statistics aren't good. No. There's actually something interesting, though, going on because of the way the monster AI works. There we so go. we have every round, the monster's going to queue up their actions and figure out what they want to do. And if it happens to target a dead character, it needs to re-roll that action. So by having multiple characters dead, you also have the ability to roll through the RNG a little bit faster than you would otherwise. That sometimes comes up because with multiple characters dead, it might even take 256 values exactly in order for it to figure out what it's doing that round. And then we call those RNG loops. Sometimes you could actually get them in real time as well, but it's a way to you're frame perfect and holding the A button down is a frame perfect way of attacking every single round. Potentially get Taz like behavior in real time. And obviously, it's hard to set up, but once you kind of notice that pattern happening, you almost sometimes exploit it, particularly in these long boss fights. That's something I want to touch on, unless there's something else you need to talk about oh, game wise for a moment. There's an interesting little bit about what exactly constitutes tool assisted speedrunning and where you put that line. One of the things that, that is interesting about what he just said is you just used a whole lot of tools to understand the mechanics of the game that then influenced your real-time run. So you're not running blind, you're, you're running with all of the information that was available to you through using tools. You're just performing as a human without those tools actively helping you at the time you're doing it. But there's this whole spectrum, there's this, there's very hard to find there are no keyboard macros, you are using a completely original console and controller, and there's nothing happening. And on the other end of the spectrum is, we're fully using an emulator with every tool possible. But there's this little bit of gray area. And where this gets tricky, and especially in the early days of Speed, uh, speed Demos archives, there were some people that were using, for instance, keyboard macros or other types of, of assistive tools. Um, then there's this other subtle problem that sometimes people, especially with limited mobility, have to use tools in order to be able to play at all. And there is definitely something to be said about trying to figure out a way to handle that gray area that's halfway between, or somewhere in that, in that space between fully tool-assisted and fully real-time runs. And, and it is something that I'm trying to work with the various communities, well, obviously as, as an ambassador, trying to figure out how to define that, talking to uh, people at, at speedrun.com and talking to the different sites, owners and, and leaders, just trying to figure out how we can help bring in more content that is, is perhaps created by people in this limited mobility community that are using maybe alternative controller mechanisms or maybe some amount of macros to make it possible for them to play. How do you categorize those types of runs? Uh, what do you do if you really are using real time in front of you a laptop that shows you a full table of of everything that you might need so that you're augmenting your gameplay. Does that, does that cross that line or not? How do, you, how do you define these types of things? So it's, it's definitely something that has always been a little bit dicey in the relationship between real-time runs and tool-assisted runs, especially when the lines start getting blurred. So back to the run, um, we saw just in that treasure room, we walked in the treasure room and the robot was right in front of the door. Um, the chances of that are, are, are pretty low, but it's a task, so, you know. Um, <laughs> and because that robot was in front of the door, we got to avoid going on that space where he was, which was a trap tile. We would have had to go in that fight. It's runnable, but still, you'd have to go in on that square and run. 
Now, if you're playing this casually, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Go in the room because that's the best treasure in the game. Um, but it's a task, so we don't really need it. We'll, we'll, we'll find some other way. And you'll see a couple of those manipulations as well. I think we've got the fabulous Dr. Un as well, that you worked a really long time on getting kind of that optimal walking. That's uh, right. Because NPCs are basically spawned on the map right away, and it takes you some time to walk over there, you have a lot of opportunities to really influence the travel directions that they have throughout there. So, for example, the robot you're trying to get onto one particular square, Dr. Un here, he's normally stuck up all the way in the corner in this graveyard. You've actually done a lot of work to route him to pull out all the way as far as you could. That's right. So manipulating this took me a few hours. Um, it's going to save maybe half a second. <laughs> 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 That's how tasks are. And so, you know, I just made him move a little closer. How, where do you usually have to go when you're, when you're talking to him? I mean, it's good if it's only two squares up. Like, <laughs> sometimes he'll dodge out of the way right when you're trying to talk to him. You talk to the gravestone instead. The NPCs <laughs> in this game <laughs> are really fiddly. So I understand, like, the, the difficulty that you would have getting not just kind of the optimal movement that you were trying to walk through in a straight line, but also kind of influencing those pathing decisions so that you are able to get, like, the absolute minimum number of steps throughout there. That's right. The trick was actually pushing the guy that looks sort of suboptimal, but by pushing against him, making him move faster, it had this butterfly effect that Dr. Un decided to go further. Um, and that's one of the things you have to look at in, um, in TASSES. I know we're getting coined towards the end game, but can I get one quick one in? Real quick. Let nope. me explain the Zombles okay, first. Cool. The, the whole yeah, reason yeah. we picked up the Mage Staff is to have some other way of attacking. Uh, we actually don't have a lot of spell slots to work with. You've not used any houses except for one outside of Earth Cave. That's right. So you've never had your magic recharged throughout of here. Um, it would take time to go to the ends. And so the Unrendable Zombles, this is why we did that detour in Sea Shrine, is just for this case. And now, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I just I just needed to read this one out because it's from Rio Quetzalcoatl. <laughs> who donates $2,001. Oh my goodness. And the donation comment merely reads, this one's for Vulagen. Oh, oh man. That is incredible, guys. Wow. <laughs> it's okay, Ryu. Have a happy birthday. <laughs> this has been an insane experience. <laughs> yes. Um, so, have we been here? Have you been here as with Taskbot to RPG Limit Break before? Yeah, this is our first appearance at an RPG Limit Break, and I'd love to make it a yearly thing. If we can continue to find tool assisted speedruns that are acceptable to the event, I'd like to do it again. This has been, quite honestly, one of the most successful runs I think we've ever had. <laughs> uh, th this is the first time at an RPG. Obviously, been to a lot of other types of events. Uh, one of the things that we obviously need in order for Taskbot to be able to play at one of these events is for more people like the Axeman to put in the hours of work that it takes to create the content that we show. And obviously one of the things that's really important to me is attribution. It's very difficult oftentimes at a GDQ when there's only a couple of minutes total to say anything. And in fact, I apologize for how much I have manipulated the commentary and <laughs> taken time from these two explaining the game in order to say all the things I've never been able to say at a Games Done Quick event about how this <laughs> stuff works. Um, but there's rarely enough time to say everything, and one of the things that's always a challenge is making sure that the effort that the original author put in is properly praised, because it's a truly magnificent amount of work. It's, it's surprising how many hours you can put into it. I've personally completed a fair number of tool-assisted speedruns. I hope to, at some point, fully complete NetHack. We've been working on the NetHack tool assisted speedrun for since 2010. So we've been working on it for nine years. Uh, we're trying to get the whole thing down to at, at the very least 2004 in-game turns, which is only four after the <laughs> bare minimum. But to do that, you might imagine, has been a real chore. Um, I can tell you, it's a lot of work. And uh, I really do want to say, if you are interested in helping us make content for these types of events. If you have the bug to, to learn the tools, there's a full community out there to support you. There are very mature tools out there that'll help you figure out 
how to disassemble the game. It sounds scary. It's not as bad as it might seem. Just ping me on Discord. Yep, we're here. There's the Task Videos Discord, and there's also a Taskbot Discord for the console verification side of it. I'm going to hand it back over to these guys because there's stuff going on that needs to be That's explained. That's right. All right, so Blue Dragon here. Uh, luckily, he's also weak to fire, so Mage Tap, another good use here. But this is your first time using Mute, isn't it, during the run? That's right. So this guy, he hits hard. He um, even if, and even if you um, uh, mute him, you still got uh, a, a difficult. So for backing off, if you don't mute him, <laughs> he's got a really powerful thunder attack. We will die. We're a white mage with 15 HP. <laughs> his his regular attack, even if he doesn't use this super powerful thunder. Um, is super strong and hits a uh, very high percentage chance of the time. So um, so we're going to mute him and just use the Mage Staff. But next coming up here, a very important pickup. Yes, it is time for the Bane Sword. And so this is an item which will cast Bane when used in combat. Bane is an instant death poison based ability, so you need to have, well, you should have somebody that's weak to poison for doing that on. But for critical hits in Final Fantasy 1, it bypasses all of the defense checks, all the elemental resistances, so you could actually use Bane on anybody. But that 3 and 256, that's a really slim chance. And we actually have, towards the later part of the game, many bosses in a row that we're going to need to use it on. So there's a little bit more subtlety than just saying, oh, we're going to wait for that 3 and 256 to happen. That's right. Yeah, this is basically what makes the task possible. Because, you know, we're a, uh, we're a white mage with 15 HP. What are, how are we going to beat a boss otherwise? But now this... These enemies are actually fairly weak against Bane, but there's four of them, and getting all four of them is actually a pretty low probability, but we're going to pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> and look at, all that, look at all that experience. So the reason why we need all this experience is for a little trick we're going to do later. Um, and we wanted to get it all in one fight if we can, because... Every time you win a fight, you've got this little celebration. It takes a little time, so let's just get it all at once, get it all over with, and um, we'll get the level that we need at the time we need it, which is a little bit later, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. For now, we're in the Sky Tower, the fourth floor. This one, you can go up or down, or left or right, as long as you get to the yeah, other teleporter. Two vertical, two horizontal, doesn't matter, pick the direction. Unless you're playing the randomizer. Then, then you might have some other places <laughs> to find in there. Shoutouts uh, to the Final Fantasy yes. One randomizer. It's a, it's a really great one. Um, I hope uh, they get to some exposure in another event. <laughs> There's some <laughs> clapping. Yeah, There's they should. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, the home of the infamous Wormek. I actually had to fight Wormek in Awesome Games and Quick as a Donation Incentive. I would have loved to see that here, although it is probably a lot of extra routing for you to drop it right is, in. It is, yeah. I, I really, every time I make a task at this, I really hope, oh, can I get more mech in here? For one thing, I need experience, and he gives you more experience than anything else. Um, but yeah, a very old task did see him, and you can run. Yeah, it turns out you can run. I, I, was, I was making sure I understood more of the mechanics of this game. I played this back when I was a kid, finished it years ago. Um, just didn't get as much chance to do it as I would have liked, so I played through it this week. And I got Warmac. <laughs> Speaking of Warmac, we have a $5 donation from Warmac. Uh oh. <laughs> that says, I heard Taskbot is on the way to fight my boss. <laughs> Think he's got the RAM to fight me. Mm. But I have a feeling he's just going to walk right on by. Beep. Boop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, now normally Team Out would be the fourth of the four fiends. We've actually done them out of order here. Um, this happens as well in a lot of real-time routes, which is carry is the fiend that doesn't really block anything, um, and you are generally pretty low damage as you are coming here naturally the first time. So if you put carry off towards the end uh, for routing, this sometimes makes sense in order to have a higher damage output and just make this an easier fight throughout here. Sorry for the noise, guys. It's not avoidable. <laughs> I hope you don't have epilepsy. Ugh. Oh. So in the, uh, in the Gurji Volcano here, you can see we've got these damage tiles, this lava. And every time we walk on a lava space, there's no encounters on there. It's a safe space. I mean, it's sort of safe because we're taking damage, although yeah. not really since we're at 1 HP and it doesn't take you any lower. Um, but we're not going to completely avoid them because we want to advance the encounters. Um, after this, we're going to go in the final dungeon, which has a lot of unrunnable encounters. And by getting just to the right spot, 
we're going to tweak that so that um, we, we avoid those. Do we have any more donations? We do, yeah. Um, speaking of, we've uh, had one staff member donate. It's time for another one. Oh. <laughs> it's Meta Sigma from Offsite. Oh. Donating $750. Guys, keep it going. <laughs> Good grief. Who says, guys, don't let Prof Palmer down. Let's make his <laughs> Earthlock dreams come true. Let's meet those incentives. I miss you all so much, and I'll see you all next year with a surprise in tow. Is Meta pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm staying out of that. I'm not touching that. <laughs> I've got $100 from Porsite. He says... Hi, Taskbot. This donation is from Clage, Girl, and Dio. We just wanted to thank you for helping us defeat all the Lamia queens in Final Fantasy II earlier this week. <laughs> so that we thank could you. set a new Lamia queen percent world record. In honor, please put this donation towards naming Titus Lamia queen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I will note that earlier in this run, we were celebrating $70,000. I noticed that we were already past 75000 over the course of this run so far. I want to see how quickly we get to 80,000 as well in this event. That's right. I think that's a challenge, folks. So <laughs> that is a challenge. We have $50 from uh, an anonymous donor who says, it's my first time at RPG Limit Break, donating because it's just plain awesome to see the runs in action. $50 from Axton who says, enjoy watching our robot overlord Show us how Final Fantasy 1 is meant to be played. <laughs> this goes for making Porum the Final Fantasy 4 Free Enterprise starting character. We have Mint donating $25. He says, I had to donate during the Taskbot run. I've seen all the amazing YouTube vids. Money to Taskbot's choice. Ah. $5 from Media Magnet. Who says, hey, Dwango and the rest of the couch. Just wanted to say hey from the Discord community at discord.tas.bot. The Media Magnet is basically my right-hand man managing a lot of sysadmin type stuff and a ton of other things. I would not be able to do what we've been able to do without the help of specifically Media Magnet, especially a Media Magnet in, on the Discord server. Um, but there's so many other people, Sinewave, Illy, <laughs> oh my goodness, I, and then there's so many people <laughs> that are a core part of this team. I'm just the presenter and organizer. There are many, many more people involved behind the scenes to make this all happen. Uh, thank you, guys. And we got Miria in seventy-five dollars. She says, "Meow." <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Miria, wherever you are. Twenty dollars from Leggy Starscream, who says, "Just wanted to give a shout out of appreciation to the White Mage getting revenge on that squid." <laughs> Tass videos are always super wonderful to watch, and what a great classic game to showcase. Fifty dollars from Falconic, who says, "Falconic and Moist Mogwai here." Wanted to give RPGLB some love for showcasing the greatest RPG of all time <laughs> and raising money for such a worthy cause. Here's hoping we can get some FF randomizer during next year's event. Ooh. And uh, Lord Hayati donates $10 and says, Excuse me? That's called the Bane Blade, not the Bane Sword. Bane <laughs> Blade. <laughs> <laughs> Let it rip! <laughs> All I know is somehow we've beaten Phantom there. One whopping experience point and gold point. Although in the back of those chests, there's like 65,000. If you ever need money, which yep. you don't at this point in the game. They have mysteriously put stuff there. There's scattered throughout here all kinds of really good stuff. Like the Mazmune, the best sword in the game. Are you going to get that? No, who needs that? Well, it's going to be a mystery how we're going to beat Chaos. We still have that silver hammer, and he's got 2,000 hit points to get through. That's right. It's a lot of hit points. I don't know, I'm expecting shenanigans, personally. <laughs> well, why would you expect that? <laughs> <laughs> Call it a gut feeling? <laughs> so we got an unrunnable here, but our Bane Sword takes quite quick care of it. Um, you might have also noticed that in the prep for this dungeon here, we visited a town, and we went to the inn to restore... Well, we restored our HP, but we also restored our magic points. And um, and we picked up something. What was that? I, I didn't notice, so maybe we'll have to uh, find out when it happens. I think it was in one of grabbed. the spell shops. Hmm. 
Sharky donates and says, Hey, Tazbot, here are 2,002 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely played. <laughs> well played, Sharky. We're coming across here on the Earth floor. That's actually a really nice formation for the real-time speedrun, because coming up we have Lich. We're doing the refights of the four bosses. They've all been augmented with additional powers. 100 extra hit points, but the real thing is no weaknesses, and generally very, very big stuff. In the case of Lich, he has Nuke, the biggest spell in the game. Um, what we have to do when we can't Bane Sword Lich here is we actually turn our mages or other weak characters to stone. So we intentionally get them petrified, and then sneak them past the boss here so that we have enough healing and the ability to escape past you. If you got one fighter, you can usually take Lich out before he cycles back around doing a second nuke there. But obviously with the Taz, you can just go right by. No worries about uh, what those evil bosses are going to be doing. That's right. About the probabilities here. So we said it's 3 out of 256 chance for Bane to work here. But if we say we're at a Fiend and we have to go first because Lich will cast Nuke and uh, nuke, our, uh, nuke our mage here, then the probability drops to 1 in 256. So we've got to get to this certain spot on the cycle. There's sort of this um, prime spot there that we have to be on every one uh, for these fiends. So we're going to have to a little wait uh, to get that RNG because there's not many um, random encounters to cycle that uh, RNG up to it. And that's also going to be a problem because after you come out of this fight, if there's only one 256 chance of it happening then you're forced to be on a certain part of the RNG for the upcoming random encounter as well. That's right. So you're going to have much more of a challenge getting back to a good state where you're not going to be attacked by a monster on the first part of the round or otherwise having a really bad encounter coming up. That's right. So on uh, battles in this game, you can have a surprise attack. You can have a... Uh, the surprise attack has the enemies attacking first. How many times has that happened? Well, none so far, and there is a little bit of a contribution for your lead character stats. So the character in slot one, their agility plus luck score, goes into influencing that by a little bit. But most of it's a base value. For the formation, there is going to be a value that is saying, this is the percentage. We talked about those earlier with Shadows. They have a 90% base uh, before they get adjusted. Warbeck, for example, has got a 75% base chance of ambushing you. Those are things which, for certain encounter formations, are going to make it very difficult to find a good entry point in here for that RNG cycle to be at. Yeah, so we're very lucky that we're able to, to uh, get that value and then um, and then get a good fight and run between the fights here that, that we have to use Bane. Another thing you might have noticed all through the run is the random encounters. What do you think about the number of enemies that have been showing up in each of them? You've been getting some pretty good fortune for a lot of these. So in terms of random encounters, there's a range for each monster in the formation. Um, and so, for example, you might have multiple monster types. It'll fill them out in order, rolling a fair die between those ranges, and then repeat until it fills it up. Um, we're generally getting at the absolute minimum of those roll sizes, and that helps with the turn order especially, because the fewer monsters on screen, the more likely the monsters in the front are going to have no person in that slot, so it just passes their turn over. That's right, and there's actually a loading frame. Every, every enemy in the battle takes one extra frame to load. So we save a little time, and you know, saving the frames is what the tasking is all about. <laughs> all right, and it is time for chaos here. 2,000 hit points we talked about. We got a Bane Sword, that would instantly kill him, but that would be no fun. No fun, no fun at all. So we're gonna use a different mechanic here. So there is a concept called morale, and normally bosses have a lot of morale. Um, they start with 255, which means even if you're a very high-level character, it compares it to your lead party member's level, you're never going to beat their morale check. But there's a spell called Fear, and this also is a 3 in 256 chance for each of these Fears landing. It's going to lower Chaos's morale by 40. And with enough applications here, this is something that happens in the glitched Final <laughs> Fantasy as well, is that eventually Chaos's morale check is going to fail. And that's not really well programmed for what happens <laughs> for bosses. So, once we have our last fear off here, Chaos is down 160 morale from his starting point. There's a really big range, and... Time. Right away. <laughs> but... It counts, Bob, it counts. Before we go anywhere, 
I need to know what Taskbot is doing to all the people that are donating. Because I just got a $2,048 donation. <laughs> oh, power of 10. Power of 10. Power of 10. Nice. Wow. From Vax Herd, with no donation comment. It's just like, here, have my money. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you very much, Baxter. Baxter is a runner that also does a lot of manipulated runs. Baxter did Dragon Warrior 3 at a Games Link Quick event. Really great member of the community and has been out to these events as well. So thank you very much for that, Baxter. Thank you, yeah. Well, unless there's something else we need to talk about, this concludes the run of Final Fantasy by TaskBot. Last things you need to know, we are at task.bot, that's the main website for all of the console verification stuff we do. Tool-assisted videos can be found at taskvideos.org. If you'd like to be part of either of those communities, feel free to swing by. Especially, best entry point possible is discord.task.bot. It's the best way to get involved with all the TaskBot stuff. If you have any interest in helping us with things like uh, making runs like the X-Men <laughs> did. If you have any interest in helping us manage our Twitter while we're doing these types of events, you don't have to be skilled in order to be a part of our community, so please join us. I want to make a quick uh, shout out um, to my very loving and very uh, patient wife for letting <laughs> me come here all week, and for my son, the Hatchet Boy. Um, I'm not sure if they'll get to watch today, but um, shout outs. And also to my mom, who I think watched almost all 16 hours of our Desert Tesla drive. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> she was a little... Uh, <laughs> That's pretty crazy. <laughs> Anything from you? I'm going to give a shout out to Nasir, who is the programmer of Final Fantasy. We didn't get to use a lot of his good yeah. work uh, for most of this run. But there is one nice thing here at the ending credits. If you ever watch these all the way through, where it's drawing this animation at the end, that'll actually result in clearing the memory out for the RNG state for the battle scene. So if you ever do these runs, watch the credits all the way through, and you'll get the exact same RNG that we had after doing this. You don't have to have any special tools. Nice. And with that, this concludes Final Fantasy. So we, le we started this by making a lot of noise, right? <laughs> I think after that run and all these donations and all the love in this room right now, we should be making even more for our, that amazing run. So let's say thank you to the crew. Thank you. Thank you.